everybody. Happy Sunday. Welcome back to the Trading Pit. We did take a little bit of a break, but we are back and ready for episode one. In segment one today, we're going to be going over finding an edge with Jeremy Newsom and looking at some of the candlestick patterns that he uses to make trades and really make decisions in the market. Segment two is going to be talking with traders with Umar Ashraf, and we're going to be talking just overall how Umar got started, some of his experiences in the market, and his idea of maybe what can happen in the markets in the next six months. Segment three is going to be the broad market recap. We're going to go over just the broad markets as we always do, and then we will do a chart request at the end for segment four, and uh, really hope you guys are ready, and uh, I'm excited to get started. All right, everyone, thank you for tuning in to segment one, Finding an Edge. We have Jeremy Newsom, founder and CEO of Real Life Trading here with us. And I was gonna go over two pairs. Um, you can find those in patterns and uh, they are called Wicked Pair Candles and they are called New White Soldier. So New White Soldier and Wicked Pair. So really the way I play these particular candles, man, is just, Again, like trend, trend spider, they just, it pops them out so that everyone kind of see them clearly. And what a new white soldier is, it's very similar to a one white soldier, but one white soldier's textbook actually have a very specific definition. It's a, a long day bullish candle found at support that opens and closes above the previous day's close. Well, this is not really a long day candle and it didn't really occur at support right so it's like what would that be called and a long time ago i kind of just with some with some friends we called it new white soldier because it's a bullish candle it's still a soldier type of candle but you can see really clearly that that candle does open and close above the previous day's close it is a bullish gap and it just shows a lot of sentiment really this candle pattern man shows that whoever sold here and sold here they're losing money, they're trapped. And how amazing would it have been to be relatively bullish on mm. Tesla uh, just one day, you know, April 13th. Beauty. So, yeah, man, they're just kind of like patterns that just kind of give me guidance into what, what the sentiment is and what people are thinking. And when you can start compounding these candles, it can give you some really, really, really good insight. Um, one of my questions is, um, you know, we talked about this a little bit. One of the things that, you know, some people use, for example, Rob Smith uh, using the strat, he actually will use candlestick patterns in force, meaning that the candle has not closed yet. Um, how exactly do you use these? Do you need to close first or can you use it within some type of kind of as it's happening approach? Yeah, great question. And bring it up, Rob. In fact, I, I'm going to be releasing an interview with him. So after hey. I got off the uh, yeah previ previous interview with you and Dan, I reached out to Rob and I'm like, Hey, I'm big time now, Rob. <laughs> so we finally had a session and I, I loved his energy, man. I, I like him in general, but yes, generally for me, when I'm looking at these candles, it depends on the time frame. And uh, these candles can be, so if I go into, let's just say uh, a 30 minute chart. So if I go into a 30 minute chart, right? You can still get these particular candles, but I do like to wait for them to close. So here's your phenomenal, just, I mean, ridiculously phenomenal hammer candle followed by a new white soldier. And the way I play it is I'm looking to go long above the new white soldier. I mean, yeah. more or less, that's pretty much it. So here's your other new white soldier. This one came in today on Tesla on the 30 minute chart. And you'll notice we haven't really broken above that candle. So that's a pretty decent resistance. So therefore, if we do break above in the next few days, and Tesla is a stock that I do think will hit $1,000 uh, between now and July, actually. That's kind of my, one of my... Uh, one of my call outs on this one, man, this, is, has, a, this has a lot of power because you, we have a gap on Tesla on all time frames. So this is a gap on a monthly chart um, and you had a wicked pair candle on a monthly chart, right? Which is extremely, extremely rare. You have a gap on a weekly chart and you had a new white soldier on a weekly chart. So we're gapping above there, we're closing above this resistance. And then on the daily, you have a gap of all this consolidation and a close above all of this volume. So tons and tons of bare volume on this particular candle, closing above that and just retesting. Man, this thing is ready to go. Woo. So I'm curious, do you ever look at confluence of um, 
like patterns. So for example, you see, you know, the same pattern on maybe three different time frames, and is that a stronger pattern? Um, or do you, or is that not a big deal? Yeah, it's a great question, man. Um, I think so. Yeah. As you start getting more and more patterns kind of coming together, I love scanning for hammers. Uh, I use TrendSpotter a lot to scan for hammers to just really give me some insights because very similar to uh, Rob Smith and like I said, the, the strat, when you're talking about a really nice hammer, like the one that we talked about over here, um, if I go back and just look at purely this candle, the fact that on the daily chart, right, you were forming certain specific candles and you zoom into a 30 minute and you have this outrageous lower shadow that just trapped everybody. I mean, look at all the stops that this candle took out. Like that is, you know, me 11 years ago. I'm just having my stop right there, just yep. buying all the puts. Oh, you know? all in one Crap. order, not even scaling them. Just buy them all in one order. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I was the worst trader in the world. So yeah, I mean, when you get that confluence, you get those additional candle patterns. Absolutely. I mean, it's it's a really really good signal, in my opinion. Awesome. And is there a specific time frame that you'll look at these more? Like, for example, I know you kind of do a mix of all different types of trading. Um, yeah. Do these work better in a weekly setting or a day trading setting? Is there any difference, uh, differential in, in the time frames as far yeah, as that goes? That's a great question, man. Um, there's not a massive difference. Realistically, I prefer to play them on a daily chart, okay. but they will work on they will work on any time frame. Um, so if we go into Let's look at the trade I, I took today on Roku on a five minute. So Roku popping in here to a five minute. And uh, one of the patterns that I, I just really, really like is um, just make sure, yep, so this is the right time frame. So you have a lot of selling in the morning and Roku was weak when the whole other market was strong. I mean, we've, we've, the market has been rampage Jackson for like three and a half weeks. So you get this retest and then you have a hammer, right? That again, would have been a nice hammer, but this is a now a wicked pair candle on a five minute chart. So a wicked pair candle is like two candles back to back of the same color with certain principles. And you know, those principles got coded into trend spider. So what I was doing is I was looking at this, I had this nice lower shadow. Then you had a, another bearish candle come in and then I had a new white soldier. So I was already a little bit bearish. However, when that new white soldier came in, I became even more bearish if we took out that support. So if we took out that support, because again, a new white soldier candle is generally a pretty bullish candle, right? Like we can see over here and over here, like you did get a bullish bounce on a five minute chart. Uh, over here, you got a bounce. Over here, you didn't. Over here, you did. Over here, you did. Over here, you did. You got a bounce, it went higher once that candle kind of got recognized, once it took out the high of the new white soldier candle. So when this bad boy came in and we failed it immediately, um, I shorted there, stopped above there, and I got out the new low. And that was a, just a nice, really quick, uh, I think I made $1,024 on that trade. Ooh, that'll pay for some steak dinners. Yeah, um, bro. I have a question, I have a question. So notice how we broke down today through that candle. Um, you know, technically that candle could have been that hammer that we saw on Tesla, which, you know, stopped everybody out. What, at what point do you say, okay, this is not going to close as a hammer. It's time to short. Phenomenal, you, phenomenal short, question. Short yeah, term, really, really. Function too? Love it, man. And that's a great representation because a lot of traders, like when you're looking at exact patterns, you do have to kind of get like a general feel for what you're doing. One of the reasons, um, again, I was looking at a short on this one was because the market was strong and Roku was weak. That's one thing. Now, a lot of people will say, well, if the market's strong, Roku needs to catch up. And it's like, well, possible. But again, think about it this way. If the market is super, super, super strong and you have a big name company that's not, what if the strong market has some type of selling? Maybe we get a day of selling at some point, Jake, right? One day of selling. What if we get that? Oh. Well, if we get some, an hour, what if we get an hour of selling, Dan, at some point in the market? Uh, well, if you get some selling in the broader market, that particular stock that's weak could get weaker. Uh -huh. But beyond all of that, without using any of that, if you're just using pure candles, you have a bullish candle, bullish candle, bullish candle, bullish candle, bullish candle, bullish candle. You have six bullish candles in a row. So that tells me let me just wait a few minutes before I just really, really hit the gas pedal hard on a trade because you've already had so much buying 
if I was going to go long, once this candle would have come in, I would have been okay to go long above that high if I was going to play it. But again, with your predominant little bearish trend right here and the fact that Roku was breaking support on the daily and the fact that Roku was weak, the market was strong, I was like, well, let me plan for a short. It doesn't mean the short was going to work and it doesn't mean the short was going to trigger, but let me plan it and see if it will work out. Makes sense. And, uh, you yeah. know, another point, you know, to that is today was all about the stocks, uh, your airlines, your Boeings, your GEs that have just had no love. And so it's almost like there's some rotation going into these, these stocks that have just been beaten down for three months. And finally you've got, because if you look at when Roku bottomed to what it topped at, I mean, that thing went over well over a hundred percent and, right. uh, you Four know, 470%. Really? Yeah. Check this out. Let me show you. Let me, let me bust this. Let me bust this out. We got June. Look at this 500% in a year. So the thing is, people are like, Roku's going to go higher. I'm like, at some point, yes. But you can't have a yep. stock go up 500% in less than a year, and just it's just going to rampage again. It doesn't work that way. So Roku is going to chop around for a while. It's going to be sideways for a bit. Yeah, there's, there's just a lot of people who have profit. And, you know, what if, what if I have 350% profit in Roku, and all of a sudden I see GE and Boeing are at and low? I'm going to sell my Roku and buy Boeing just because. Bingo. Bingo. Yeah. Uh, and dude, the chart that you posted, I mean, I don't know exactly who posted. I'm assuming it was you. Um, it was but <laughs> I was like, looking at the way you had this chart, I was like, I feel like this is a Jake chart. This <laughs> Boeing setup. So I retweeted it. Not that that means anything, but I retweeted the chart because it was so perfect. Um, I mean, a blind one-legged squirrel could have taken that trade. In all honesty. Like the pressure was building. Like look at Boeing with this higher low right here. You have this higher low. You have, I mean, first of all, it's Boeing. So it's not going away. It's not going to zero. If Boeing goes to zero, we have massive issues in America, like massive, <laughs> massive fundamental issues. So you make a higher low, you have a gap right here that never fills. And then if I pop my patterns back on, so we had some signals, right? We had a new white soldier right over here. Uh, today is a new white soldier. We had a wicked pair, bullish candle pattern, which is, again, is a very strong pattern. Wicked pair, when it broke higher, boom, nice higher move. You have another new white soldier, boom, it traded that. Another new white soldier, boom, it triggered that. So you just kept getting bull signal after bull signal after bull signal. Plus it's Boeing, and it's down like 87%. So yeah, let's look for longs. And then today, dude, it gapped above the highs of all these candles oh my gosh like look at the open everyone who shorted boeing everyone who shorted boeing since mid uh, you know late march early april was trapped on open today recipe for a short squeeze yeah man this thing is going to go probably to 200 by the end of the, end of the month well, um, I mean, it's it's got some strength it broke out through you know so like you said, I mean, that, that horizontal level was pretty much make or break for the shorts. And what is that moving average that it gapped up above as well? Uh, my blue, this is the 50 EMA. Okay. So it, it was just smacking his head against the 50. And so now you're above all short-term moving averages on the daily chart. So that's a big deal. And if I pop over here to the weekly, which I know I can do the multi-time frame, but if I go over to the weekly, we, we just don't have that, that much in the way at this point. Um, closing by the 10, the 20 is probably right about here but you don't have loads and loads of things in the way. And, and again, I just, I love Boeing long-term just makes sense to me. I think right now. I mean, it's like you said, it's only down like 85%. So if you get to a point where supply and demand, just those, those, uh, those principles start kicking in. And, you know, if you don't have any more supply, any more people selling, it, yeah. you don't even need, you don't even need more demand. You just need less supply for the price to, to go up. <laughs> I agree. I totally agree. And, that's, and people kind of forget that right now in, the, in this particular market. Like they just want the market to roll over so hard because of the economy. And I, not that I disagree. And not that I'm, say, I'm not saying that, you know, Wall Street is not disconnected from Main Street or whatever the current pool of verbiage is. But the simple fact of the matter is, if supply dries up, you don't have to have that much demand because a lot of the bears are saying volume is not increasing. Bro, it doesn't have to. 
It doesn't have to. Like if supply is weak and no one's selling, then demand doesn't have to be that strong. Exactly. Well, this is one that we talked about earlier in the week that you had your eye on um, as a stock into the rest of the summer. What are two other um, you know, positions that, or stocks that you think uh, could, be, could be ones uh, that heat up in the summer, if you will? Yeah, well, I got to bring up the last one that I talked about in, our, in the last uh, Trend Spider show was Fiverr. Fiverr. Oh, uh, man, you, you <laughs> Murderous. Absolutely <laughs> murderous. Um, Fiverr is, it might get arrested for first degree murder, man. I mean, this thing, you had two new white soldiers on a weekly chart. Um, this is a pattern that I'll have coded in one day at some point in Trend Spider, but this is actually a battalion of soldiers. So you have a new white soldier followed by a new black crow and the, the third new white soldier triggers the first one. It's a wrap. Um, okay. Yeah, so Fiverr is going absolutely berserk. But the ones I'm looking at right now, I think for the end of the summer, SPR, this is another one that has just gotten absolutely no love. Uh, I do have a position in this one. So full disclosure, um, SPR, again, Spirit Aerosystems, it's been struggling for a while. It's been on the struggle bus for a while and you got a really, really good close. The volume, man, look at this volume. And we have closed above that volume today with, again, a new white soldier that had a bearish candle. And then today is a new white soldier triggering the first one. Oh, so SPR, man, make some coinages on this one. I'm watching it close. Um, so that's one of my charts. Okay. I'm not going to say Tesla. Tesla, uh, <laughs> into the next few weeks, I I'm just – I'm bullish on it, man. Like, it's a great, great gap. I'm excited to see what's going to happen. Worst case, worst case scenario, we retrace back to 800. But I just do not see this not going higher in the next few days, just mainly because of that gap. But another one that I really, really like, man, long term, Marriott. Marriott, yeah. Mar I mean, Marriott's not going anywhere. You know, like this, this, this company is not going anywhere and it is down magnificently. Look at this weekly chart. This is a double bottom. Uh, this is one of the strats candles patterns. I think this is a one, two, one or one, two, three or something like that. But here's your bearish hammer with a gap down and then bang, we automatically close above that. Holy smokes. Like this close already on a weekly. I know it's only uh, a specific day when we're filming this, but if it closes above here at the end of the week, 120 is a no brainer on Marriott. And then last but not least, I know, I know you asked for three, but here's four. Beyond Meat. Beyond. This is, whoo, man, it's, the bears still hate on this thing, which is good. You have tons and tons of resistance here, loads and loads of resistance. We actually are, work, we have gotten a close above it there. We're consolidating now sideways. And my only thought, is if we close above this candle, which is last week, if we close above the high of that candle in the next three weeks, we'll hit 200 by the end of the year. Ooh, holy mackerel. Well, it's already been there, so. And, and there once, but I'll do it again. I haven't not heard anything about, uh, you know, anything about Beyond Meat other than it's expanding like crazy, so. Um, yeah, well, th that, exactly. Not only that, but uh, you have Yum China is beginning to use B uh, Beyond Meat in, in a lot of their products over there. Oh, oh. And so you have, um, like, they're, they're starting to merge into pepperoni on pizza, right? Yep. Uh, like, yeah, like Pizza Hut. So Yum Yum is owns Pizza Hut. You have Taco Bell. So they're starting to work on Beyond whatever they put in Taco Bell meat. <laughs> um, they're working on that. Uh, and KFC, like they're interest, they're interested in creating chicken substitutes now. So I mean, you have possibilities for this to really, really start rocket shipping. I, I think. And again, also the candlestick patterns are quite nice as well. Beautiful. Well, um, we really, really appreciate you coming on and sharing your knowledge, not only about the candlesticks, but just your overall views in the market. And uh, you know, it was, it was just. I was just so lucky to meet you back in uh, Airplane Jane's uh, presentation or uh, or conference back in uh, last June when Bitcoin was absolutely ripping. And, uh, you know, it's just, I, I still am just shocked that you were saying Spotify was your favorite stock at 275 and now, you know, it's at 800. Oh, you sh oh Shopify. Yeah. Shopify, yep. 
Where did I say yeah. Spotify? Sorry, Shopify. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, Shopify. I mean, dude, I remember you talking about that on, uh, on what is that, the 26th, 27th of June or something last year. And I'm like, I've never even heard of this company. And, yeah. <laughs> and Jeremy's like, all time one. Yeah, this was it, man. Shopify is a, is a maniac. And the, the crazy part is it's not even, it's not done. That's, that's what's insane. Like this is going to be a market. They're going to be buying um, so many other platforms and like software as a service companies now that they have cash and they're growing revenue and they're getting, I mean, they're, they're reducing their debt like crazy. They're landing and expanding, man. This is a power power powerhouse for sure. Landing and expanding. This looks like one of your, uh, one of your apples back in the day before it really got started. So bingo. Uh, yeah, I agree, man. I totally agree. Yeah. So I'm excited to see what this one, how this one plays out long term. Awesome. Well, I'm looking forward to seeing where it goes. And uh, once again, Jeremy Newsom, founder of Real Life Trading. Thank you so much for uh, for joining us. I'm looking forward to your event in September that I will be attending. And uh, we'll see you in Nashville then. So pumped, man. Thank you so much for this opportunity. And for all those listening, I appreciate your time. Thank you. Talking with traders, we have a special guest, Umar Ashraf. He is the founder of Stock Market Lab and uh, just a prominent trader in the industry and really excited to interview him and learn about his experience in the markets. Thank you for joining, Umar. Thank you for having me, man. It's, it's a pleasure. Yeah, absolutely, man. Well, um, let's jump right into it. So, you know, you're, you're, pretty, you're still pretty young yourself. When did you actually start trading? Uh, I started trading right when I turned 18. Uh, I was in high school. I have an early birthday, so I jumped into trading. The moment I turned 18, I had no idea how to trade. I had no idea anything about thinking about it, but I jumped right into it right off the bat. All righty. And what, what actually sparked your interest with you know, trading, the markets, just overall? Uh, it's funny because I remember when I was in high school, I, I, wanted, I, I was looking at, at a way to make more money and grow the money I had, I had about 20,000 saved up. So I went on Forbes.com and I started looking at the richest people in the world who made the most amount of money and all the people that came up, like George Soros, I think came up and it was like 400 million, 800 million, 1.2 billion. Mm -hmm. Obviously they're not trading, but they're running large hedge funds. So it's related to stocks. So I was like, aha, this is what I need to do. Right. So that's what sparked my interest. Awesome. And as far as like, when you first jumped in, did you jump into stocks? Were, was it penny stocks? Was it, what, what exactly did you initially start trading? I mean, initially I started trading things I knew about. Like my first trade ever was JCPenney. That was my okay. first trade ever because I saw JCPenney around, at that time was around $10. So I was like, oh, it's JCPenney. I see them everywhere. They're never going to go bankrupt. They have to go up. And obviously right now they're going bankrupt, right? So I was like, they're got to go up. They got to go up. They got to go up. So what I ended up doing was that was my first trade, which went well. Then I traded Macy's and it was all name brands that I knew about. And it was just kind of like, oh, I know that they're too low. They're, they're got to go up. So I, I just kept trading things I knew about. And so you're 25 now. So you started about seven years ago then? That was about seven years. So what, about 2013? So right after the market had just dipped from the euro crisis. And correct, we were, uh, correct. We were smooth sailing from there. Awesome. Well, you know, what was, you know, when did you first make your big trade? I know you trade pretty heavy money, but you know, everybody starts somewhere and sometimes those, those big trades can, can just be even a percentage gain. What was the big one for you that really got you hooked? Uh, I think I was hooked from the beginning, not because of any big gains. It was more so just the, the competitive side of it. Like I have to figure it out, I have to figure it out. Cause I think that's what really got me hooked and just trying to figure out and elevating my, my game. But I think my biggest day was within my first year. I remember I bought a penny stock. It was, it was AEZS and they came out with some FDA news or something. I forgot what it was. And I made 300% or 400% overnight, but it was a terrible trade because I didn't know news was coming out. I had my full account in it and I technically got lucky. So when, when that happened, I think, I think that was, and that, on that, on that trade, I probably netted 15, 25,000 or something, but it was a very terrible trade. All my uh, account was in one trade in a, in, in, a, in a biotech, knowing that anything can happen and thank God it worked out. For me. That's what I was like, wow, I, I did this in one day. Imagine the end, endless opportunities, right? But I didn't start seeing massive gains until maybe the last two years. Especially the last 
I'd say 18 months is when I really started growing and focusing heavily on trading. Love it. And I remember, uh, you know, watching you last May and I'm like, who's Umar? And I've seen you do this account challenge. I'm like, holy crap, this guy is serious. So, um, you know, I, I've, I've learned a lot from just following you and just, you know, the overall psychology of trading is something that you're really great at. And, um, you know, when did you finally realize that you wanted to teach and teach people about this whole process and your experiences? Sure, sure. So I, the, the teaching thing was originally something I didn't want to do because obviously when you put yourself in that space, it comes off as scammy or it comes off as why is this person teaching? So I always wanted to stay away from it. But when I was trading my second year towards second and a half year and I started seeing consistency, people, my friends, people around me, they started saying, Hey, can you help me out? Can you help me out? Can you help me out? So I started helping a few people out. And then that grew into like, Hey, why don't I do a class? in-person class then from there that started organically growing and things just started you know excelling so at that point it was kind of like why not just scale this and 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 grow it and the whole thing with the teaching business is you know what happens in this industry a lot of people pick up a book learn from the book aspect and then go teach but it's like if you really want to learn you have to learn from someone that has experience which is why i don't know if, even if you saw my instagram like i logged in my tos showcasing it's not just the screenshot it's the actual platform that hey i have actually traded and done well it's not just you know showcasing like hey i'm doing well or buying a cool car or whatever so so that was the second aspect because when i started trading there was a lot of things and a lot of noise that kind of affected my trading in a negative way and and they would give you false hope hey you learn how to make money in one month learn how to make money in two months so my whole goal was okay what if i do this i want to be transparent in a point where i tell people you're not going to make money until maybe a year Yep. You want to join our community. You don't want to join our community community. That's a different case, but Hey, it's going to probably take you a year and that's being realistic. That's like being fair. Mm -hmm. Some people it takes yep. two years. So that was where, you know, it, 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 that's, that was the route I wanted to take. And that's where it, it got me more interested on, on building SML and scaling that. Makes sense. And I mean, it's, it's a lot easier to learn from someone else's mistakes than, you know, blow up your own account, but you know, it is, it is uh, something that I think has been crucial to my learning is, you know, blowing up a couple accounts is just part of the process. And I think, you know, I think we've talked about this before. So, um, you know, it, being able to join a community where you do get to learn some of those mistakes that, you know, more experienced traders have made, but that doesn't mean that, you, you know, you still have to feel the pain of losing money to really understand, you know, a loss. And so, um, you know, I agree. I agree. I agree. Mm -hmm. I think that's awesome that uh you and then one thing about trading just just to add on to that i think one thing about trading is there's certain things that i can tell people a million times don't do don't do don't do but i think the only way you learn is through experience like until you get burned i think people are not gonna learn so it's kind of like having a big drawdown having a mental breakdown in trading losing money i think when people lose money and they feel the burn that's when they're gonna grow so it's one of those things that you have to go for absolutely i mean some of my biggest lessons have been through my biggest losses. So um, definitely something I can relate to. Um, so, you know, right now, uh, what are you typically trading on price action, you know, indicators? I know, I know a little bit about your trading style, but for those that don't, you know, how exactly are you trading? Uh, my trading style in the past six, seven years has changed multiple times from trading different types of securities, going for penny stocks, to big name stocks, uh, to now trading options, right? Now, what I do is I typically say this, I trade the same names over and over again. I built myself to a level where I'm very comfortable on knowing how they move, how they move according to the market. If the market's gapping up, uh, how will Zoom move? How will Apple? How will you know? How will this move according to Spy? How will it move according to ADD? So I built a solid comfortability around that. So when I trade, I trade simply off price action, and the only indicator that I kind of have on at times is VWAP. That, that's okay. like the only indicator I use. I don't use RSI, MACD, any of that. It's just simple price action, reading the tape. And, and since I trade options, I don't care about getting a 10 or 20% move in stock. I care about 50 cents, maybe a dollar, one point move up or down. If I can capture one point move up or down, I'm good. That's all I'm, I'm aiming for. And doing that consistently, you know, every single trading day is the goal. Not going for 30%, 40% win every single day. I, I remember, uh, I don't know if it was on your post, or if it was something that you posted, but you know, it's these people, uh, somebody asked you, bro, why didn't you hold? And you're like, 
because I'm comfortable with that gain and I don't need, you know, to make get the whole piece of cake. I just want my piece or the whole cake. I just want my piece. So um, that's a great point. You know, just because you don't get the full move does not mean that you weren't successful. I mean, if you make money, that's the whole point of this game. So uh, definitely, uh, you know, thank you for sharing that. And, um, you know, it, it kind of comes back to the point. Sometimes you really don't need a lot on the chart. Sometimes the more on the chart, the more decisions you have to make <laughs> and, uh, and, and the more, you know, not or yeah, loose ends you have to put together where if you're just using a couple of variables, you, you're able to get a harder signal. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Like I, I, it took me some time to realize that. But what I've noticed is the days I, I go for the full cake, I end up mm -hmm. losing even that small piece and more. And then it becomes like this whole cycle of continuously losing. So it's like, if I just keep taking a piece every day, in four or five days, I'll have a cake. Four or five days, I'll have a cake. Four or five days. And then I'll have multiple cakes instead of trying to chase a cake every single day. We'll have a wedding cake in no time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, so to end this interview, um, you know, I obviously nobody knows what's going to happen, but where do you see the markets in a year? Do you do you think the Fed is going to continue to inter, you know, interfere and kind of add liquidity? Do you think this is just a big move up to just drop it in the future? Um, obviously, nobody knows, but would love your opinion on what you think. I think it being election year, uh, you know, makes sense for them to drive the markets as much as possible towards that. Obviously, looking at it now, uh, but I think the interesting moves are, are going to start happening in 2021. Uh, but once again, yeah, no one knows, but I still think this market pumped up is, is a huge hoax. I think everything is overvalued, overpriced. There's a lot of things happening. 40 million plus people unemployed. This is going to change our whole uh, uh, commercial real estate side. It's going to change a lot of businesses, a lot of retail aspects. I think once this starts hitting, it's, it's all lagging right now. I think once it actually starts hitting, the market will then see it and then maybe say, wait, wait, we're overpriced. But even if the market thinks we're overpriced, the way the feds are injecting money, it's like, you know, what, what's really going to happen? But I think this, this crash or this, this recession is going to change the way the world operates. Like it will do that. By the time it's done, I think the whole world is going to change in a lot of different ways. I completely agree. And, you know, I don't think in bad ways, I think there's going to be, uh, you know, innovation that maybe sped up a decade just because of the things that we've had to deal right. with. So it's going to be, uh, and the thing about the market is just because the market goes down, there's always something that's, you know, the market likes and just being able to find those stocks that, you know, there is a market for and people are actually playing it. You know, those are the ones to play during the crashes. You don't, you know, you, their money has to go somewhere. If something's crashing, people have cash and they want to play something else. So um, I've, al I've always seen that in penny stocks. When the market crashes, penny stocks generally move up just because people have money and they have nowhere to put it and they start chasing pennies on, on these pumps. So, you know, it's something that is really fascinating how it all works. And, you know, just wanted to thank you for sharing your experience and your knowledge and, you know, just your overall uh, vision on the markets going forward. Thank you so much for having me, man. Much appreciated. Hey, you're very welcome. Once again, Umar Ashraf with Stock Market Lab, founder and CEO. Thank you so much for joining us and we'll see you soon. Thank you so much for having me, man. Take care. Speak to you soon. Going into segment three, broad markets. What a week and a half, or it was just one week, but it felt like a week and a half by all the price action. SPY, um, we're going to go over obviously SPY, the Q's, the IWM, um, and even take a look at VIX, uh, just to see kind of the, the area that it's trading in. Now, um, SPY, I did do something a little differently than I usually do, right? I usually anchor the volume weighted average price and the uh, volume by price from this top candle or this bottom candle. Now, one thing that Brian Shannon teaches is anchoring from year to date, month to date. And so that's something that I was like, hey, well, let's see what, how it does with the, uh, the anchored volume by price. So what I did here was I anchored the volume by price from this January 2nd candle, which was the, the start of the year. And you can see that, you know, when we identified this earlier in the week, you could see we had this massive volume gap above. There was no supply until right at around 321, 320. Shocker. We literally melted up right to that area this week simply because if you don't have anybody 
that's breaking even above until 321, you don't have a lot of selling pressure coming in. So um, this was just a really great example of being able to identify the volume gap and then identify the supply zone and really just see how price respects that. Now, going on to the weekly chart, you can see here that the uh, weekly MACD did cross a couple weeks ago and we have done nothing but go straight up since. Notice that when we do have these MACD crosses below the zero line, you do have a nice continuation for quite some time. Um, who knows how long this is going to last? I mean, this has pretty much gone straight up, and I've been pretty bullish the whole time, and I'm kind of thinking now what the heck is going on. But if you look at the individual charts, it's actually still fascinating to see some of them are still kind of like in a very uh, interesting setup. So um, that is SPY, clearly just an absolute rip for the week, and uh, you know, I've seen a lot of people post and make a lot of money this week. So Congrats to everybody on that end. Going into the queues, we did hit all-time highs this week. The biggest thing that I want to point out here is the fact that we have a very interesting balloon breakout. If we have this previous high here, we extend it over. You'll see that we finally did break through it. And notice what we have here. We've got a big chunk of volume above this resistance zone. So that's something that, you know, is is it's not like this is going to gap up on Monday, but the fact that buyers were in control at the top of this range is really important to, to keep in mind because remember, for all of those people that sold up here, there was somebody buying to absorb those shares. And so that was something that was really strong on the raindrop, on the daily. Now on the weekly, we've got the similar kind of setup here with the MACD cross a couple of weeks ago. We actually had the MACD cross a little earlier here. And you can see uh, compared to SPY, and you can see that same thing. We've gone straight up into new all-time highs. So same thing, except this time we did not cross below the zero line. So that's something to keep in mind. And uh, you know, honestly, this cross right here and this cross right here almost look identical, um, at least for now. And so you know, I can't believe that. So this happened from December to April. So I, I mean, that's that's a solid four months. So if we bottomed out in March, April, May, are we going to possibly top sometime in June as well? Very similar to kind of this time frame that we had in uh, 2018 into 2019. We'll just have to see. Going into IWM, this is one that's really interesting, especially with that balloon breakout on Wednesday. You could see from this previous high, there was a lot of volume above the resistance. The next day, you didn't necessarily have the best raindrop, but you didn't have like a lot of volume at the low end. You just had kind of volume accumulating here. And then you had this massive gap up. And honestly, we still have a gap above here. Um, that's at 165 to, uh, or let's say 163 to 165. And then one of my favorite things to bring up on this chart is uh, the fact that we had that volume magnet. So remember, a couple months ago at this point what was this yeah end of march like everything we had this bottom here i drew the support trend line and you can see here from this point most of the volume was holding above and so notice how over the last two months we mentioned that supply should act as a magnet above for price and look what we got literally exactly almost to the t up to this point and now we start to kind of say all right we're we're definitely getting into a supply zone. This is an area where a lot of people are breaking even. And so that could be something that, you know, could halt the price action into next week. We'll just have to see. Um, going into VIX, the last one, kind of shocked that this thing didn't go down more, honestly. Um, let me just change this here. Yeah. So going into VIX, you guys can see that, you know, we've gone down pretty hard in the last couple, um, a couple, even weeks. I mean, at this point, we had a little bit of a stagnation here and then just continued down. So the fact that support is way down here below 20, you know, that's that's quite a bit for VIX to drop, but it's not out of the question. So um, who knows what's going to happen? There is a lot of room to move. It, this is pretty much right in the middle of this. Uh, pretty much a channel. Uh, these aren't exactly parallel, but they're close enough. And so we'll have to see what happens um, into next week. All right.
righty, everyone. Going into the last segment, chart requests. I mean, after the broad market segment, you can see we had an absolutely wild week. But honestly, individual stocks even had a more wild week or wilder week. Sorry, that was bad English. But um, going into some of these requests, thank you all for um, mentioning some of the tickers that you'd like to see. There were a lot of tickers that kept popping up, so it was pretty easy to pick out the top eight. So the first one is Boeing. I think this was easily probably the most popular um, ticker last week just because of how much, um, you know, it's really done nothing the last two months and finally it broke out. And so you can see this here. We finally broke out of this horizontal resistance area here. And you can see in the raindrop all of that volume near the top of uh, the range here. So that showed us for anybody that was selling Boeing, on uh on june 3rd which was wednesday there was somebody absorbing that supply above the resistance line so we don't care if it was selling volume or buying volume we just want to know where those shares were absorbed if there were not buyers up here there would not be a little chunk of volume here it'd be somewhere else where buyers finally stepped in so uh the fact that we broke out of this you know was definitely kind of like all right we may be on to something and then you just had your Literally, your move up from a close of around 173, 175, and we literally hit almost 220 on Friday. So that was pretty fascinating. But the more fascinating thing about this is the fact that if we do anchor that volume weighted average price, the Alpha Trends anchored VWAP from March 4th, which was the high here, you'll see that we almost perfectly tested the anchored VWAP here um, on the weekly chart. And so what you can see is if I wasn't using sensitivity here, you wouldn't have been able to capture that move. And so, you know, going into next week, I did add a sensitivity alert just in case we do start to try to test this area again, and we'll have to see what happens. But um, this was truly fascinating to see the price action literally miss this Alpha Trends anchored VWAP from March 4th by literally a few dollars. So going into the next one, we have Tesla. Tesla is one, not that Tesla. Tesla is one that, you know, it's got the volume shelf. Obviously, we've been talking a lot about the volume shelf lately. And remember, the volume shelf is essentially just this big chunk of volume here that really acts as your point of control from a certain period in time. So in this case, we bottomed out on March 18th. I want to start the volume by price from this bottom area. You can see since this point, most of the shares that have been purchased or sold have been up at this area above. So the fact that we did finally get that bounce off the volume shelf, pretty much a gap up out of the volume shelf last week, was something that was really interesting and a cool case study on this particular feature. Now, the weekly candle is absolutely just the most bizarre thing I've ever seen. Um, this is really just uh, a very odd type of uh, setup here. I mean, it is very similar to you know, kind of what we did here, we we did break out and we've talked about this a little bit. We broke out of this resistance area. Literally, this resistance became perfect support before just straight being right back up. Now, the question is, is do we break the uh, the previous highs? That is really going to tell us where um, things go from there, because, you know, if this breaks, there's a lot of people who, well, I don't know if there's as many people that are short as there were, but you know, once we break through this area, it's on. And uh, anyone who is short is likely going to get squeezed. So um, that is Tesla into next week. We still have this volume shelf. You can see on the daily, on the raindrop, a lot of that volume during the second half of the day was near the top of the range. So you can see that here. Um, so that is something to also keep in mind. Buyers were absorbing supply at the top of uh, Friday's range. Going into SQ, SQ is another one that really just I mean, if we're going to talk about a perfect case study on volume shelves and launch pads, this was one. So um, going into the daily, you can see we anchored the volume by price from this March 18th low. And you can see just this massive volume shelf forming. We did also have a volume shelf here. And notice that this acted as the same exact thing, acted as a launch pad for the move up. And so now we're pretty much at the same exact area here where essentially we, we really moved up strongly through this area um, and uh, from here we'll just honestly at this point we, we all we have to work with is this this previous high I mean that's pretty much your your technical uh, level here going into next week and um, if this breaks kind of similar with uh, Tesla are our shorts really going to be squeezed 
or you know, has this gone on long enough and we're going to exhaust right near the previous high? I have no idea. We'll have to see what happens. Um, I did want to mention to you guys the supply zone is here. Um, remember, when we were way down here, we had this massive supply zone above. So this initially was resistance. So remember, these volume shelves can be resistance initially because that's where people are break even. Those people who now are back to break even may want to get out. That adds to the supply and demand equation. You have a little bit of consolidation. And if there is real demand, this supply zone will turn into a volume shelf as, as shown here. And you know, this was a really cool example of just literally launch padding right off this area to the next area. And notice how we, we kind of uh, did have the same type of thing. We, we kind of pulled back and then buyers were still strong enough where price was able to catch a bid and just continue up. Um, so SQ, I mean, with the economy opening up, Square does sound like one that may, you know, be one that still has room to move up. Um, but if anyone told you they knew exactly what was going to happen, they'd be lying. So just remember that nobody knows what's going to happen. We only have the charts to give us idea of where price may go. Going into CRM, uh, Salesforce, this is a really cool example of um, what I did here was I anchored the volume by price from the March 18th low. I then anchored the Alpha Trends BWAP, anchored BWAP from this pullback here. So this is kind of your, your move up, your pullback, anchor from the pivot, anchor from the blue raindrop. And then you can see how well this has acted as support, um, at least from the blue raindrop over the last uh, day. I guess Friday was really the day that we tested this and moved right back up. We have the volume shelf here. We have a ton of volume at the top of the range here. I mean, this is kind of crazy. I mean, this shows that this move down was literally on barely any volume at all. We know that this was probably a liquidity um, kind of move here, trying to trap somebody and just get them out. You can see that it didn't take much volume to do that. And then you've got this big bulb here showing that buyers were in control into the end of the day, both during the first and the second half of the day. Um, going into the, uh, the weekly, you can see that this previous area of, re of support acted as support, acted as support, broke down, acted as resistance. And now that area is now acting as support once again. We'll have to see what happens from here. But, um, you know, historically, this is very strong support. And, uh, you know, with the volume shelf on the daily, there are a lot of things for the bull thesis. But, um, you know, remember, there's a lot of people going back out into the uh, into society right now, not wearing masks. Not saying coronavirus is going to come back as as strong as it was, but you know, the if that becomes a narrative again, this could just be a reason to sell off, and so that's something to keep in mind with some of these, with just overall charts in general. I mean, when we when we were in pretty much free fall, there was nothing that was safe. I mean, there's maybe one or two things that I can't think of, but pretty much everything got just destroyed. There is too much liquidity now, though. There's so much backing by the Fed. It's really going to be hard to mimic what we saw in March. Um, Microsoft, this is one that looks very similar to Square, right? It's very similar um, situation where we have the anchored volume by price from this bottom candle. And then you can see we've got that volume above this volume shelf. And if you look back at SQ, you will see a very similar setup. You had volume above the volume shelf kind of breaking out like a, a new plant growing. And, uh, you know, we'll have to see what happens from here. But the fact that buyers did get to absorb that supply above this area tells me that they could be, um, you know, in control. Now, this weekly candle, this is something I made a while ago. I'm just going to delete all this and just get a fresh chart here. Um, the fact that we did have this uh, engulfing, at least engulfing the body of this previous candle, this body is engulfing this body. It does show that buyers were definitely in control. Um, are we going to have something like this where we just melt up for the next two weeks? Uh, and when I say like this, I mean this area right here. Um, do we just melt up the next two weeks and then we crash? Uh, if I knew that, I'd probably um, you know, not be here. So uh, let's see what happens into next week. The volume shelf is very real. The raindrop is showing buyers are in control. So you know, just going by the facts, it would be hard to you know, have a bearish thesis here. But that does not mean anything. I mean, bears, 
Bears can easily come back in and have their day too. So um, the raindrops are not an end-all be-all. They're just a way to visualize kind of that volume flow within the candle. Going into Disney, you know, I thought Disney would probably be up more than this by now, but, um, you know, we'll, we'll have to see what happens. Uh, there is this gap above on the daily. If we look back to kind of how we were doing this before, notice here that we do have this volume shelf that was created once we gapped up. Notice that the price was able to gap up very quickly through this area because there was no volume. This was the volume gap. And so the fact that there was really no previous holders there allowed the price to move very quickly up because there was no supply above. Notice once we finally got to this area, we caught a, we caught a little bit of a, uh, you know, ask where people were, were kind of uh, breaking even, getting out. And then this volume shelf continued to grow. If you remember, this volume shelf was not this big. This is a function of all of these shares being kind of traded here and making this a bigger shelf. Finally, supply dried up or demand outpaced supply, and we had our launch pad here. Now, the, the raindrop does not look that great. I mean, um, and if you think about it, uh, I think today or yesterday they came out with uh, the highest number of COVID cases in Florida and since some, some date, but uh, like since reopening. So that may actually hurt Disney into Monday. I mean, if we're looking at the raindrop, it clearly shows buy, uh, sellers were in control here because buyers were not able to keep up with supply and the price was, was uh, you know, had to drop in order for buyers to come in. And we can see that on the right hand side here. Now, on the weekly candle, we've got a little bit of a different story. We've got, you know, this very strong weekly candle. We've got the gap above, as I mentioned before. However, we do have a gap below as well. So, um, you know, this is one of those kind of neutral charts where there's a gap on both sides. And uh, I think news and uh, just the overall um, media coverage of Corona may uh, have some impact on this into the next couple of weeks. And this is where, you know, the charts may not have a lot of, um, have not a lot of influence, even though the raindrop is showing that buyers uh, really did kind of step out and sellers came in to push the price down on Friday. So. Um, that is something to keep in mind with Disney. Remember, it's not all about charts. You do have to keep in mind the fundamentals, the overall kind of story here. GE looks almost identical to, uh, to Disney. Notice that we had this huge gap up, but a lot of the uh, volume during the second half of the day was actually creating new lows. And so you can see that here because if buyers were actually in control, they wouldn't be absorbing price here. They'd be absorbing it somewhere up up here. So the fact that supply was taking over is something to consider for GE into tomorrow. Um, and uh, it is important to realize that we do have that gap above, but gaps do not have to fill immediately. Sometimes they don't ever have to fill at all. Um, but from my experience, they fill more than they don't. So, uh, you know, GE was a really cool case study last week of looking at Boeing using the Alpha Trends Anchored View app. So as we mentioned in the video on the week, uh, during the week, uh, midweek video, this was um, something we were watching, right? We had this anchored view app from the February 12th high, and then you can see all of that volume above the Alpha Trends anchored view app, and then you've got your big gap up here. So uh, worked out perfectly, kind of like a textbook play. And then if you were playing Boeing, um, or if you're playing GE as a laggard to Boeing, the Alpha Trends anchored view app was a good constant to use there. So uh, on the longer term side of things, you can see if I scroll out really far, you know, this trend line support acted almost perfectly here. We did have this false breakdown before we just bead right back up. So remember, if you do have false break, if you do have a breakdown, sometimes give yourself maybe a little more than a day or a second to to think maybe this is just a big, um, you know, stop loss event to try to get people out before the rip. Um, and that would have uh, saved me a few dollars on this one. but. Uh, still was able to make some good money on GE, but did have to uh, kind of enter back after getting stopped out on this trend line. Um, going into Twitter, this was a really fun one into uh, last week. Notice that you can see here if we do go on the weekly chart and we anchor the volume profile from this high here you'll see that we did have this huge kind of launch pad here for price. There was a ton of shares holding here. Supply dried up. 
demand either remain constant or demand outpace supply, and that's how you've got this launch. Now, the fact that we did not really have a very strong close through this resistance area is something to keep in mind into next week. However, um, this is really something I'm looking forward to when we have weekly raindrops because I would really be able to see what's going on within this wick. So definitely looking forward to having that out at some point because it is going to give, especially swing traders, a whole new perspective on the weekly and monthly candle. Um, one thing I want to mention as well, if we compare the week, uh, the daily hollow candle versus the daily raindrop, you'll see something that's pretty interesting here. You'll see that even though we've got this big wick here on the daily, you'll see that you know there's a lot of you know, essentially a lot of volume in this wick. So the fact that we were able to kind of see that there were buyers absorbing supply at the top here where you can't see that in the wick, that is something to consider. I have seen red raindrops um, with this type of formation have an absolute explosion afterwards. Um, but the main thing here is really being able to compare the two side by side and see, okay, Sure, the hollow candle looks like kind of a shooting star, or whatever you want to call it here. I, I'm, it wouldn't be exactly a shooting star, but clearly shows sellers came in and uh, you know there was a big move down before close. However, this raindrop tells a little bit of a different story. So we'll have to see what's, what you know that looks like into next week. But overall, I mean, we do have uh, a gap above still to fill. So if we turn on the gap snake here, you can see that, you know, highlighting this right here does show that we actually have not filled that gap yet. So that is something to keep in mind. Um, and there's really not a ton of really big gaps below. You can see the gap snake did capture this. And this is one of the big things about the gap snake. Notice this did not technically fill all the way and the gap snake was able to capture that. So being able to not have to go in and manually look and scroll into, you know, the most zoomed you can to see this, the gap snake is able to tell you this did not fill fully. So going into the last one, MRO, this is definitely one that was a really cool um, case study into last week. So essentially what we have here is we've got um, the Alpha Trends Anchored View app. If you guys did watch the video, uh, midweek video, we mentioned that this big gap down on March 9th was something that had not fully filled yet. And this, this, rectangle here was there to show that. And so the, what I was talking about midweek was the fact that ExxonMobil, which has been a leader in this industry, in the sector, actually had already, um, this had already been filled like in like early May or late April. And so the fact that MRO had not filled this gap was one of the reasons why it was, you know, something to keep in mind into Friday, especially when you had all of that volume above the anchored view app here. So you can see, same thing. All of this supply was absorbed above the Alpha Trends anchored view app, and you can see that buyers were definitely in control. And instead of filling the gap, we just jumped right over it. So that's something that I'm also not a huge fan of, at least if I was a bull, because now this gap is still open. However, we do have a ton of other gaps above. We've got this one above at 980. We have this, uh, I think that's the only one that hasn't filled. Nope, this one still uh, is a very small gap at 1243, which has not filled. So um, this is just the power of the gap snake to be able to see these things without me having to go through each, each candle essentially looking for gaps. This highlights them for me and I'm able to go about my day without having to spend 30 minutes looking for these. So that is MRO. It was a really cool case study. We do want to anchor the volume by price. You will see something similar here. You know, it doesn't matter if we anchored it from April 1st low or the February 12th or sorry, the January 3rd high. Um, we still were creating a massive volume shelf here. It, it doesn't matter which way you show it. Um, so the fact that you had the anchored VWAP above the raindrop, you had the volume shelf forming it was just a recipe for a possible explosion and that's exactly what happened. So you're not always going to have that set up, but it was one that worked really well. So um, that is all the time we have for chart requests, everyone. Thank you so much for posting in Twitter and telling us what you'd like to see. And uh, we'll see you next Sunday.